The Talkative Tree. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Dodge. The Talkative Tree by Horace Brown Fife. Dang vines! Beats all how some plants have no manners. But what do you expect? when they used to be men. All things considered, the obscure star, the undetermined damage to the stellar drive, and the way the small planet's murky atmosphere defied precision scanners, the pilot made a reasonably good landing. Despite sour feelings for the space service of Hartaz, steward Peter Colin had to admit that the casualties might have been far worse. Chief Steward Slichow led his little command, lest two third-class ration-keepers, thought to have been trapped in the lower hold, to a point two hundred meters from the steaming hull of the Peace State. He lined them up as if on parade. Colin made himself inconspicuous. "'Since the crew will be on emergency watches repairing the damage,' announced the chief in clipped, aggressive tones, I have volunteered my section for preliminary scouting, as is suitable. It may be useful to discover temporary sources in this area of natural foods. Volunteered his section, thought Colin rebelliously, like the supreme director of Hartaz, being conscripted into this idiotic space fleet that never fights is bad enough without a tin god on jets like Slichow. Prudently, he did not express this resentment overtly. His well-schooled features revealed no trace of the idea, or of any other idea. The planetary state of Hartos had been organized some fifteen light-years from old Earth, but many of the homeworld's less kindly techniques had been employed. Lack of complete loyalty to the state was likely to result in a siege of treatment that left the subject suitably, quote, re-personalized, unquote. Colin had heard of instances where in mere unenthusiastic posture had betrayed intentions to harbor treasonable thoughts. You will scout in five details of three persons each, Chief Slichow said. Every hour, each detail will send me one person in to report and he will be replaced by one of the five I shall keep here to issue rations. Colin permitted himself to wonder when anyone might get some rest, but assumed a mildly willing look. Too eager an attitude could arouse suspicion of disguising an improper viewpoint. The maintenance of a proper viewpoint was a necessity if the planetary state were to survive the hostile plots of Earth and the latter's decadent colonies. That, at least, was the official line. Colin found himself in a group with Jack Amet, a third cook, and Eva Yurtuk, powdered food storekeeper. Since the crew would be eating packaged rations during repairs, Yurtuk could be spared to command a scout detail. Each scout was issued a rocket pistol and a plastic water tube. Chief Slichow emphasized that the keepers of rations could hardly, in an emergency, give even the appearance of favoring themselves in regard to food. They would go without. Colin maintained a standard expression as the chief's sharp stare measured them. Your talk, a dark, lean-faced girl, led the way with a quiet monosyllable. She carried the small radio they would be permitted to use for messages of utmost urgency. Amet followed, and Colin brought up the rear. To reach their assigned sector, they had to climb a forbidding ridge of rock within a half a kilometer. Only a sparse creeper grew along their way, its elongated leaves shimmering with bronze-green reflections against the stony surface. But when they topped the ridge, a thick forest was in sight. Yurtok and Amet paused momentarily before descending. Colin shared their sense of isolation, 
They would be out of sight of authority and responsible for their own actions. It was a strange sensation. They marched down into the valley at a brisk pace, becoming more aware of the clouds and atmospheric haze. Distant objects seemed blurred by the mist, taking on a somber, brooding grayness. For all Colin could tell, he and the others were isolated in a world bounded by the rocky ridge behind them and a semicircle of damp trees and bushes several hundred meters away. He suspected that the hills rising mistily ahead were part of a continuous slope, but could not be sure. Yurtok led the way along the most nearly level ground. Low creepers became more plentiful, interspersed with scrubby thickets of tangled, spike-armored bushes. Occasionally, small flying things flickered among the foliage. Once, a shrub puffed out an enormous cloud of tiny spores. "'Be a job to find anything edible here,' grunted Amet, and Colin agreed. Finally, after a longer hike than he had anticipated, they approached the edge of a deceptively distant forest. Yurtuk paused to examine some purple berries glistening dangerously on a low shrub. Colin regarded the trees with misgiving. "'Looks as tough to get through as a tropical jungle,' he remarked. "'I think this stuff puts out shoots that grow back into the ground to root as they spread,' said the woman. "'Maybe we can find a way through.' In two or three minutes they reached the abrupt border of the odd-looking trees. Except for one thick trunk giant, all of them were about the same height. They craned their necks to estimate the altitude of the monster, but the top was hidden by the wide spread of branches. The depths behind it looked dark and impenetrable. "'We'd better explore along the edge,' decided your talk. Amet, now is the time to go back and tell the chief which way we're... Amet! Colin looked over his shoulder. Fifty meters away, Amet sat beside the bush, with the purple berries utterly relaxed. "'He must have tasted some!' exclaimed Colin. "'I'll see how he is!' He ran back to the cook and shook him by the shoulder. Amet's head lolled loosely to one side. His rather heavy features were vacant, lending him a doped appearance. Colin straightened up and beckoned to Yurtok. For some reason, he had trouble attracting her attention. Then he noticed that she was kneeling. I hope she didn't eat something stupid, too, he grumbled, trotting back. As he reached her, whatever Yurtok was examining came to life and scooted into the underbrush with a flash of greenish fur. All Colin saw was that it had several legs too many. He pulled Yurtok to her feet. She pawed at him weakly, eyes as vacant as Amet's. When he let go in sudden horror, she folded gently to the ground. She lay comfortably on her side, twitching one hand as if to brush something away. When she began to smile dreamily, Colin backed away. The corners of his mouth felt oddly stiff. They had involuntarily drawn back to expose his clenched teeth. He glanced warily about, but nothing appeared to threaten him. "'It's time to end this scout,' he told himself. "'It's dangerous. One good look, and I'm jetting off. What I need is an easy tree to climb. He considered the massive giant, soaring thirty or forty meters into the thin fog and dwarfing other growth. It seemed the most promising choice. At first, Colin saw no way, but then the network of vines clinging to the rugged trunk suggested a route. He tried his weight gingerly and then began to climb. I should have brought your tuck's radio, he muttered. Oh, well, I can take it when I come down, if she hasn't snapped out of her spell by then. Funny, I wonder if that green thing bit her. Footholds were plentiful among the interlaced lianas. Colin progressed rapidly. When he reached the first thick limbs, twice head height, he felt safer. Later, at what he hoped was the halfway mark, he hooked one knee over a branch and paused to wipe sweat from his eyes. Peering down, he discovered the ground to be obscured by foliage. "'I should have checked from down there to see how open the top is,' he mused. "'I wonder how the view will be from up there.' 
"'Depends on what you're looking for, Sonny,' something remarked in a soughing wheeze. Colin, slipping, grabbed desperately for the branch. His fingers clutched a handful of twigs and leaves which just barely supported him until he regained a grip with the other hand. The branch quivered resentfully under him. "'Careful there,' whooshed the eerie voice. "'It took me all summer to grow those.' Colin could feel his skin crawling along his backbone. "'Who are you?' he gasped. The answering sigh of laughter gave him a distinct chill, despite its suggestion of amiability. "'Name's Johnny Ashlew. Kind of thought you'd start with what I am. Didn't figure you'd ever seen a man grown into a tree before.' Colin looked about, seeing little but leaves and fog, I have to climb down, he told himself in a reasonable tone. It's bad enough that the other two passed out without me going space-happy, too. Watch your hurry, demanded the voice. I can talk to you as easy all the way down, you know. Air holes in my bark. I'm not like an earth tree. Colin examined the bark of the crotch in which he sat. It did seem to have assorted holes and hollows in its rough surface. I never saw an earth tree, he admitted. We came down from Hartaz. Where's that? Oh, never mind, some little planet. I don't bother with them all, since I came here and found out I could be anything I wanted. What do you mean, anything you wanted? asked Colin, testing the firmness of a vertical vine. Just what I said, continued the voice sounding closer in his ear as his cheek brushed the ridged bark of the tree trunk. And if I do have to remind you, it would be nicer if you said, Mr. Ashlew, considering my age. Your age? How old? Can't really count it in earth years any more. Lost track. I always figured being a tree was just a nice, peaceful life, and when I remembered how long of some of them live... Ah, oh, that settled it, Sonny. This world ain't all it looks like. I it isn't, Mr. Ashlew? asked Colin, twisting about in an effort to see what the higher branches might hide. No, nope, most everything here is run by the life, that is, by the thing that first grew big enough to do some thinking and set its roots down all over till till it had control. That's the outskirts of it down below. Uh, the other trees, that jungle? It's more than a jungle, Sonny. When I landed here, along with the others from the Arcturian Spark, the planet looked pretty empty to me, just like it must have to... Uh, watch it there, boy. If I didn't twist that branch over in time, you'd be bouncing off my roots right now. Uh, uh, the, the thanks, grunted Colin, hanging on grimly. Dog on vine, commented the windy whisper. He ain't one of my crowd. Landed here years later in a ship from some star towards the center of the galaxy. You should have seen his looks before the life got in touch with his mind and set up a mental field to help him change form. He looks twice as good as a vine. Uh, he's very handy, agreed Colin politely. He groped for a foothold. Well, matter of fact, I can't get through to him much even with the life's mental field helping. Guess he started living with a different way of thinking. It burns me. I thought of being a tree, and then he came along to take advantage of it. Colin braced himself securely to stretch his tiring muscles. Uh, maybe I better stay a while, he muttered. I don't know where I am. You're about fifty feet up, the sighing voice informed him. You ought to let me tell you how the life helps you change form. You don't have to be a tree. No? Uh-uh. Some of those boys that landed with me wanted to get around and see things. Lots changed to animals or birds. One even stayed a man, um, on the outside anyway. Most of them have to change as the bodies wear out, which I don't, and some made bad mistakes trying to be the things they saw on other planets. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that, Mr. Ashlew. There's just one thing. The life don't like taking chances on word about this place getting around. It sort of believes in peace and quiet. 
You might not get back to your ship in any form that could tell tales. But listen, Cullen blurted out. I wasn't so much enjoying being what I was that getting back matters to me. Don't like your home planet, whatever that name was? Hartaz. It's a rotten place, a planetary state. You have to think and even look the way that's standard, 30 hours a day, asleep or awake. You get scared to sleep for fear you might dream treason and they'll find out somehow. Whee! I heard about them places. Must be tough just to live. Suddenly, Colin found himself telling the tree about life on Hartaz and of the officially announced threats to the planetary state's planned expansion. He dwelt upon the desperation of having no place to hide in case of trouble with the authorities. A multiple system of such worlds was agonizing to imagine. Somehow the oddity of talking to a tree wore off. Colin heard opinions spouting out which he had prudently kept bottled up for years. The more he talked and stormed and complained, the more relaxed he felt. If there was any ever a fella ready for this planet, decided the tree named Ashlew. You're it, Sonny. Hang on there while I signal the life by root. Colin sensed a lack of direct attention. The rustle about him was natural, caused by an ordinary breeze. He noticed his hand shaking. Don't know what got into me talking that way to a tree, he muttered. If your talk snapped out of it and heard... I'm just as good as repersonalized right now. As he brooded upon the sorry choice of arousing a search by hiding where he was, or going back to bluff things out, the tree spoke. Maybe you're all set, Sonny. The life has been a thinking of learning about other worlds. If you can think of a safe form to jet off in, you might make yourself a deal. How'd you like to stay here? I don't know, said Colin, the penalty for desertion. Whoosh! Who'd find you? You could be a bird or a tree or even a cloud. Silenced but doubting, Colin permitted himself to try the dream on for size. He considered what form might most easily escape the notice of search parties and still be tough enough to live a long time without renewal. Another factor slipped into his musings. Mere hope of escape was unsatisfying after the outburst that had defined his fuming hatred for Hartaz. I'd better watch myself, he thought. Don't drop diamonds to grab at stars. Well, what I wish I could do is not just get away, but get even for the way they make us live, the whole damn setup. They could just as easy make peace with the Earth colonies. You know why they don't? Why, wheezed Ashlew, they're scared that without talk of war and scouting for earth fleets that never come, people would have time to think about the way they have to live and who's running things in the planetary state. Then the gravy train would get blown up, and I mean blown up. The tree was silent for a moment. Colin felt the branches stir meditatively. Then Ashlew offered a suggestion. I could tell the life your size of it, he hissed. Once in with us, you can always make thinking connections, no matter how far away. Maybe you could make a deal to kill two birds with one stone, as they used to say on earth. Chief Steward Slitchow paced up and down beside the ration crate, turned up to serve him as the field desk. He scowled in turn, impartially at his watch and at the weary stewards of his headquarters detail. The latter stumbled about, stacking and distributing small packets of emergency rations. The line of crewmen released temporarily from repair work was transient as to individuals, but immutable as to length. Slitchow muttered something profane about disregard of orders as he glared at the rocky ridges surrounding the landing place. He was so intent upon planning greetings with which to favor the tardy scouting parties that he failed to notice the loose cloud drifting over the ridge. It was tenuous, almost a haze. Close examination would have revealed it to be made of myriads of tiny spores. They resembled those cast forth by one of the bushes Colin's party had passed. 
Along the edges the haze faded raggedly into thin air, but the units evidently formed a cohesive body. They drifted together, approaching the men as if taking intelligent advantage of the breeze. One of Chief Slichow's staggering flunkies, stealing a few seconds of relaxation on the pretext of dumping an armful of light plastic packing, wandered into the haze. He froze. After a few heartbeats, he dropped the trash and stared at ship and men as if he had never seen either. A hail from his master moved him. "'Coming, chief,' he called. But returning at a moderate pace, he murmured, "'My name is Fraser. I'm a second assistant steward. I'll think as unit one.' Throughout the cloud of spores, the mind, formerly known as Peter Colon, congratulated itself upon its choice of form. Nearer to the original shape of life than Ashlew got, he thought. He paused to consider the state of the tree named Ashlew, half immortal but rooted to one spot, unable to float on a breeze or through space itself on the pressure of light. Especially it was unable to insinuate any part of itself into the control center of another form of life as a second spore was taking charge of the body of Chief Slichow at that very instant. There are not enough men, thought Colin. Some of me must drift through the airlock. In space I can spread through the air system to the command group. Repairs to the peace state and the return to Hartaz passed like weeks to some of the crew, but like brief moments in infinity to other units. At last the ship parted the air above Headquarter City and landed. The unit known as Captain Theodore Kessel hesitated before descending the ramp. He surveyed the field, the city, and the waiting team of inspecting officers. Could hardly be better, could it? He chuckled to the companion unit called Security Officer Tarth. Hardly, sir. All ready for the liberation of Hartaz. Reformation of the planetary state mused the captain, smiling dreamily as he grasped the handrail, and then formation of the planetary mind. End of the Talkative Tree by Horace Brown Fife.